Good evening, everyone. Nice to see many familiar faces and equally nice to see unfamiliar ones. Uh, I said yesterday at a session that uh, we always try to start just a tiny bit late, uh, like the wonderful carpet makers who put a little flaw in the carpet so as not to offend God with their perfection. Um, so thanks for bearing with us. Um, there are Quite a few people I would like to thank tonight for making this evening possible. Primary, of course, is uh, SFU in, in its various departments. Uh, we, we are in the Gold Corp Center for the Arts at SFU Woodwards, and thanks to them. I'd also like to, to thank uh, the program in World Literature at SFU Surrey, who've been a major partner in this event. And I think the, um, the World Literature program is quite unique. It's probably the first of its kind in Canada. And, um, stands out as a, as a standalone BA program. Um, they really, at, at the World Literature Program, try to approach literature and other cultural productions from a cross-cultural perspective. So they are looking at how does culture travel, how does literature travel. And I find that quite fascinating and ties in a lot with, with Indian summer. So they move across historical periods, they move across different genres, they even, in, you know, look at pop culture and film, and I think it's a, it's, it's a wonderful program. Some of the students from the program are here tonight and have also volunteered for the festival, so it's great to see the level of engagement they have. Uh, it's relatively young, but they've already sponsored this session uh, at Indian Summer, and I believe also um, some authors at the Vancouver International Writers Festival, which brings me um, to uh, another of our partners, the Vancouver International Writers Festival. It's a pleasure to, to work with uh, such a long-standing and such a thoughtful festival and to have Hal Wake, its artistic director, um, not only as the moderator tonight, but a partner throughout, um, throughout our efforts. Um, oh, I should mention in terms of SFU World Literature that Anosh Irani, one of the speakers tonight, will be teaching a creative writing course at uh, the World Literature Program this fall, which was a result of him being on a panel at Indian Summer last year. So it's nice to see these things happening. I'd also like to thank uh, Penguin Books Canada for supporting this evening. Now, um, before um, the session starts, I just do want to make note of a few people here in this room who've, uh, who've worked a lot on the festival. This is the last event. Uh, Rahul Sen, my colleague from Delhi Teamwork, has very quietly been making sure everybody comes and goes on time and dealing with all kinds of logistics with a cool head. So a big hand for Rahul, please. <laughs> and also to all the volunteers who've really worked hard on this festival. Really, thank you so much. So we've sort of been accused by people of putting this panel together purely on the basis of looks, which is... <laughs> which is not true. It's based on literary merit and talent, and they just happen to be incredibly good looking. Um, but it's my honor tonight to introduce the moderator, who is one of the best I've ever had the pleasure to hear, Hal Wake. Hal Wake is the artistic director of the Vancouver International Writers Festival. And Hal, many of you in Vancouver will know him over the years of, of being on radio, of interviewing several authors, and you'll know that he's a pleasure to listen to. Hal, thank you so much. Thank you, Sirius. It's a great pleasure to be here, and they'll know that uh, people were not chosen on their looks when they look at me. That's <laughs> obviously clear. But uh, it's true, it's a very uh, attractive panel. And I'll get right to the business of introducing them. Uh, the panel discussion is, uh, the title is, Who Do You Think You Are? And it's uh, interesting that there's such a strong Canadian reference there because uh, Alice Munro wrote uh, a wonderful collection, Who Do You Think You Are? Um, she meant it in terms of uh, who do you think you are, meaning don't get too big for your britches. Uh, whereas this discussion is going to be more about, um, about identity. Who do you really think you are and how does it affect uh, your writing? And um, uh, we couldn't have put together uh, the panel, a better panel than we have this evening. 
Gurjinder Basran's uh, debut novel, Everything Was Goodbye, was the winner of the Search for the Great BC Novel Contest in 2010 and the winner of the BC Book Award and the Ethel Wilson Fiction Prize for Outstanding Work of Fiction in 2011. In 2012, Chatelaine Magazine named Everything Was Goodbye as their book club pick and CBC listed Gurjinder as one of the 10 Canadian women writers you need to read now. She studied creative writing at SFU and she lives in Delta. And I just want to read a couple of quotes about the book. A brave book, also a pleasure to read, emotionally engaging, sensuous, vibrant, and beautifully observed. Heartbreaking and beautiful, everything was goodbye, is an unforgettable story about family love, loss, and the struggle of living in two different cultural worlds. Please welcome Gurjinder Basran. David Cheriandi lives in Vancouver, teaches in the Department of English at Simon Fraser University. His first novel, entitled Sukayant, uh, was shortlisted for the Governor General's Award, the Amazon.ca Books in Canada First uh, Novel Award, a Commonwealth Writers Prize, a BC Book Prize, and the City of Toronto Book Prize, and was longlisted for the Scotiabank Giller Prize and the uh, Dublin International Impact Literary Award. His second novel, entitled Brother, is forthcoming from M&S. And Alistair MacLeod, the esteemed Canadian short story writer, said about Sukoyant, this is an electrifying novel by an extremely gifted writer. It's about personal history, but it is also much more than that. It's about time and place and the individual's quest for a vantage point between the new world and the old. Sukoyant bridges geographic, cultural, and generational gaps, and it is told with great beauty and sensitivity towards loss and pain that's extremely rare. The writing itself is of the highest order. This is a novel that will with, or remain with readers for a long time. Please welcome uh, David Cheriandi. Anal Sharani was born and brought up in Bombay and moved to Vancouver in 1998. He's the author of the acclaimed novels The Cripple and His Talismans, The Song of Kohuncha, which was a finalist for the CBC uh, Radio's Canada Reads, and the Ethel Wilson Fiction Prize. It's been published in 13 countries. It's been a bestseller in Canada and Italy. His play, Bombay Black, was a Dora Award winner for Outstanding New Play. He has been nominated for the Governor General's Award for Drama for his anthology, The Bombay Plays. His novel, Dahanu Road, was long listed for the 2010 Man Asian Literary Prize, and about it, the Sunday Times of India said, Anosh Irani does for Iranis what Rohintan mystery did for Parsis. The Irani community comes alive for those who do not know it. And the National Post said, Anosh Arani's third novel, Dehanu Road, offers a blend of personal family memories, historic truths, and rich storytelling. It's proof positive that there's another superior talent from Southeast Asia living here. In writing about distant worlds, he shows us the exotic other while at the same time enacting on foreign stages the moral challenges we all face. Please welcome Anosh Arani. things close and do we have to turn them on or are they on? They're on. Um, the, the kind of subheading for this discussion is about how um, personal history and upbringing and identity affect things like language and, and your writing and uh, your subject matter and so on. So it seems to me that uh, we really have to start by finding out about your heritage and your upbringing. So, um, Gurjinder, let's start with you. A mini bio in about three minutes, two minutes. I'm used to giving this one. Um, my family is originally from the Punjab in India uh, and uh, immigrated to England, where they lived for many, many years. Um, I was born in England, uh, and then when I was 20 months old, uh, came to Canada. 
um, and where I've lived um, since uh, in the lower mainland of Vancouver. Um, so I find that uh, um, there's no quick answer to where are you from. It's, uh, it's, it's a bit of, bit of all of those things. Well, we'll come back because I want to talk more about upbringing. Do you have any family in the audience? No. So you can be completely honest. Completely. We don't have to worry. Yeah. <laughs> David? Um, Heritage and upbringing. Okay. Um, well, I was born in, in Canada, uh, but my parents are from uh, Trinidad in the Caribbean. Um, one, uh, my father's of uh, South Asian uh, descent. Uh, my mother's uh, black, uh, mixed in other ways too. Um, and I grew up in Toronto. In the suburbs? In the suburbs, in Scarborough or Scarberia, as, as it was known. Shout out to... <laughs> oh, wow. Oh, there's now Scarberia I have, now here. Now I have family. I have family here. <laughs> you do have family. Yeah. It's, it's, uh, normally we're ashamed of, it, of admitting that, but <laughs> not today. And now I live here. Anash. Um, I was born and raised in uh, Bombay. And I moved to Canada in 1998. Um, my grandfather uh, was from Iran. So when he was about five or seven years old, he left Iran and uh, came to India via Karachi on a, on a donkey. Um, and now I try and travel business class whenever I can just to <laughs> make, up, make up for that. And um, when it comes to my upbringing, uh, my mom is in the audience tonight, so any bad manners that I may display, you can talk to her about it directly. <laughs> as, you, you're, are you blaming her? Yep. <laughs> <laughs> well, carry on, carry on with upbringing, because that, that's one thing that, uh, that you guys didn't touch on, and feel free to jump in and... Well, in, in my childhood, um, I can remember that there was a lot of uh, whiskey. You know, everyone loved to drink and, uh, and smoke um, and, and tell stories. And uh, there's one very specific uh, image that I have uh, in memory that I have in mind is uh, at my grandmother's house, there used to be this, um, there used to be this brand called Aristocrat Whiskey. Those in, from India will know it. And it, it wasn't a very good brand of whiskey, but they had these large glass bottles. And after the whiskey was over, my family would store drinking water in it. And so as a kid, I would go to the fridge and drink water from that bottle, and it would always taste of whiskey. And I thought that's what water tasted like. <laughs> so when I would go to my friends' homes, I would say, man, your water tastes really strange. <laughs> and uh, that's, uh, so that's the kind of, uh, you know, <laughs> over to you. <laughs> yeah, that's... <laughs> And top, that is identity in a nutshell. Yeah. <laughs> top that. Was it, was it rum in your family? Yeah. Um, <laughs> I can't, I, I don't have a story to equal that. I feel I'm going <laughs> to be in that situation a lot. But um, I guess my parents, um, uh, I, I grew up in uh, the part of Scarborough, which is very close to uh, the border of Pickering. And I just found out recently that, uh, so there's the Pickering nuclear power plant and they, they did this diagram of people who are apparently in the highest risk area where, where I grew up. So I'm, I'm going to grow up, unfortunately, right At Risk of just from... Well, uh, they, they believe that there are these kind of low, low leaks um, in the last little while. But uh, so far, I've been okay. Um, um, but I've always been puzzled by my, my parents, uh, or there's an answer there uh, to the question of identity. My, when my parents left the Caribbean, they could have stayed in parts of Toronto being one of these diasporic capitals of the Caribbean. They could have stayed in a place where there are a lot of people of Caribbean background. But um, for some reason, they moved um, as far away as possible from, from, the community. from this community, yeah. Yeah, the community. And um, growing up, um, at, at times I felt, well, this is so puzzling. I mean, the, I'm the only one um, who looks like me, who has this particular background. And, um, and yet, in other ways, I kind of saw it as this was their effort to... I guess they, they made that choice. They wanted to leave their homeland and come to another place. Um, and they were proud uh, of who they, who they are, and, uh, as, as I continue to be. But they also 
had this idea of moving elsewhere. Did they connect with uh, other people in the Caribbean community, even though they didn't live? I mean, were you drawn in in any way to that background and heritage and culture? Uh, in certain ways, yes. Um, my parents did um, continue to have lifelong friends from the, from the Caribbean. And uh, I don't know if it's just a coincidence, but two of my very best friends in the um, kind of the housing complex where I, where I grew up, um, they were also of Caribbean background, not exactly the same as mine, of, of uh, Bayesian background and, and Jamaican background. So uh, in a certain way, I was kind of sensing and, um, I don't know, affinities of experience with others. I mean, I had friends of all different sorts of backgrounds, uh, good friends of all, but I think something was happening there. I could, I could have a conversation with these friends that I've just mentioned, um, also born in Canada, but having parents from the Caribbean, that I, I might not be able to have exactly the same way as with, with my other friends. Well, there was no whiskey, uh, <laughs> no, no low levels of you know, chemicals, but... Uh, um, my so you're just fine. Yeah, <laughs> I, I, I'm pretty well adjusted, yeah. No, I, uh, I'm not, but for all different reasons, and we don't have time for that. Um, my family moved over, uh, several families, my, my mother's siblings all moved over to Canada within several months from England, um, and we all, uh, we all lived in close proximity. Um, and there were very, very few uh, Indians here at the time in, in 1973. Um, and so it became a, a community. Everybody became an auntie and an uncle. Uh, and weekends were spent in, in kind of a normal Canadian way. We all gathered at someone's house, and there would be hockey on the radio, because it wasn't on TV. I don't know why. Uh, there was whiskey. The men would drink whiskey. The women would make rotis. And the children, we would roam the streets. At, and so really a pretty normal um, family existence. And I remember that suddenly changing when VCRs, um, you know, hit the neighborhood because all of a sudden that was my first introduction to Bollywood. Uh. So we could rent these movies. Uh, and that was my first inkling that I was, I was different, that, um, that I wasn't like the other kids in the neighborhood. I had this whole other, um, other way of being. And although I had grown up with the food and the language and I knew that... I was Indian, um, seeing it expressed in a different way than I was experiencing uh, was my first kind of cultural shift. Now, you've written about, th th this is a question for, for Gurjinder and, and David, and then I've got a, a slightly different one from Anosh, simply for Anosh, just because of the different um, experience of um, being a first-generation immigrant as opposed to children of immigrants. But we, we know that, that sometimes um, children of immigrants come under some degree of pressure to maintain the cultural traditions because parents want to make sure that that's passed on. Was that a big part of your childhood in any way, that there were expectations that, that uh, were given to you about how you behaved in a certain way? Yes, but never, never in a, it was never spoken. It was always just understood. Uh, it was always understood. You could tell by the way your parent, you know, furrows their brow when you ask if you can have a sleepover. You know, it was just something we didn't do. Or, uh, you know, swimming lessons. No, no, Indians don't swim. Uh, you know, so they're just, they're these ex things that you just accept as, as a young child and not until you're much older and maybe in your teens do you actually question it. Um, so there was never any, you know, uh, any rules or expectations. It was always just understood. It was always understood by um, watching the adults' disapproval of others. So if they disapproved of something that was happening in the, the community, um, you just understood that that was not acceptable. In your novel, when uh, that teen thing hits, there was ac there's conflict between parents. And was there conflict in your, in your teen years where you said, I want to I wanna live a different life? Yes, absolutely. I, I think my mother, if she was here, would say that I, you know, I almost killed her. <laughs> um, I laugh about it now, but uh, yeah, um, I didn't. I didn't ask for permission. I, I was the youngest of. I am the youngest of six children, so I knew that I should not ask for permission, because the answer would always be no. Uh, and so I knew that um, I should just do what I want and, and and suffer the consequences if there there were one. Yeah. David. 
Um, I didn't have any pressure from my parents to, to be, um, you know, to either identify with the Caribbean or be Caribbean. And um, it's interesting because um, uh, I, have, I have a couple friends who are uh, sociologists, which is, is not really as dreary as it sounds. And they tell me that um, uh, it's, it's actually, a, it's an assumption that actually might not be supported by, um, I don't know, uh, research, empirical research that, uh, you know, the parents who come from another country want their children to, um, adopt, to, to yeah. adopt the country of their homeland rather than to be Canadian. And it may, in fact, be the, the process of uh, what? Identifying or becoming you know, Caribbean. Uh, not, not necessarily that's what I'm, I'm doing, but or Indian or whatever else. Uh, might be more of a, of a second generation immigrant phenomenon. This interest, this awakened interest. And, and uh, as much the, um, what, the... Um, ideals, maybe even fantasies associated with, with that. That might be a second generation immigrant phenomena as much as it might also be a, a first generation. Well, then the natural question is, did you at some, have you at some point in your life as second generation felt like you wanted to go back and learn about things that you, you might not have been taught as a child? Yeah, yeah, I think so. I think in certain ways that's been one of the things um, that I've explored in my writing. Not the, not the only thing, because I've, al I've also wanted to explore uh, the Canadian experiences outside of my background. I mean, now, uh, uh, pertaining to other, you know, other immigrant groups or, or, or uh, Aboriginal peoples or, or white uh, settlers, you know, generational experiences. But yeah, definitely um, it, it was something that I wanted to learn more about and I found it interesting that my parents weren't particularly eager to share that information or particularly desirous uh, of me to explore that. They didn't stand in my way, but um, you know, it's, well, why, why would you, the, the implicit question is, why would you want to go back there? Why would you want to learn of that? Um, you know, I guess they came from a particular kind of, um, it might be complicated by class, you know, this idea that they, they left um, in quite impoverished, you know, relatively impoverished circumstances, and why would you want to go back there and learn about that? But I think it, um, I found their story inspiring in a way, in a very, uh, you know, mm -hmm. um, uh, humble and yet all the more inspiring because of that. And I wanted to learn more about it, and, um, and so I, I embarked upon that journey. So, Anosh, you brought your heritage and your upbringing with you and land in North Vancouver. I think you, you told me that you, the first three years you were in North Vancouver, you just stayed, you couldn't believe the rain and you stayed there totally alone. It was the saddest story I think I ever heard in my life. <laughs> well, I, but, yeah. but I'm interested in whether um, when you came here, uh, what different perspective or understanding you might have developed about your heritage and upbringing because you were removed from it? Was there a, a different understanding? Well, the first thing I realized that is, is that I would have to work over here. You know, <laughs> that, um, because growing up, none of us really did any work. I mean, we, and so that's something I had to uh, learn fast. I mean, like, there was no one to make tea for me. And it's like, what's wrong with this country? <laughs> so, but, but for me, uh, you know, it's interesting when you, you ask the question about pressure, for example. Uh, I felt no pressure at all because the fact that I amounted to anything would come as a surprise. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, to, <laughs> if, if, like, I, I showed a lot of Modest promise. Modest accomplishment yeah, would be yeah. sufficient. Yeah, I mean, I showed a lot of promise in my childhood. Uh, you know, I'm like... <laughs> I was a good student, I was very good at sports, um, and then I, I even did my you know, degree in economics, um, and I, I excelled at that too, and then after that I did nothing. I just, um, so when I was 21, I grew my hair long, I didn't shave, uh, I rode my motorcycle through the red light district of Bombay, uh, I played soccer, I was part of a dance company. So when I told my mom and dad I want to move to Canada and study writing, they were actually supportive. 
like good <laughs> because for two or three years I did absolutely nothing. So it was a huge. So that's the trick for those of you. Uh, <laughs> don't show too much promise. <laughs> Always underplay everything, and then people will be completely surprised. Um, <laughs> But for, for me, what happened when I came here, and, and yes, those early days were very depressing for me and they were very tough, was because I, for the first time in my life, I realized what homesickness was. Uh, you know, when you're from India, I mean, I was born and raised in Bombay, first 24 years of my life there. I came here and uh, I lived in North Vancouver and the only things that I saw were cats and they were very well fed. Um, and. Uh, I, I just felt something was wrong with me. I, 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 f I felt something was missing. It was almost as though there was an arm or a leg missing and I realized that's, that's what they call homesickness. Um, so eventually it, it helped me um, to write and, and sort of look back at, at my uh, background, what are my stories? Uh, what story do I want to tell over here? Why have I come here, you know? So it didn't change your perspective on those stories, it just gave you the ability, the, the drive, to go back into them and remember them and retell them. That's the first thing that happened, but then the distance, what it does for you is it gives you perspective. You know, as a, as a writer, you have to be able to write from the inside and the outside. Um, so being in Bombay for the first 24 years, I was very much an insider. Then when I came here, you know, I, I, I saw India in a, in a different way, or at least Bombay. I, you know, India is too vast, and even Bombay is too vast. Um, but I started seeing my own experiences, my own stories, with a different uh, kind of perspective. So that was Canada's gift to me, in a way. Isolation was the gift, but it, it was very difficult to go through. Mm -hmm. um, we're going to have some readings from e each of the writers so that you get a sense of their work, although many of you may be completely familiar with, with all of the books. but. But since we want to tie this discussion about identity back into, into the writing, it would, it, I think it would be useful for you to hear. Um, and David's going to read first, but, but one more question before we get to that. And that is, was there anything either in your personal uh, background or, or larger cultural uh, influences that led you in any way to be a writer or consider being a writer or... Is your writing tied in any way to personal family history or, or cultural influences? Um, there's, um, my book is about um, a relationship between a, a son and a mother who has dementia, uh, who's, who's obviously uh, forgetting things. And, and um, there, was a, there was a reading I gave in the city uh, recently, and I was kind of walking through the city uh, casually, and I saw the, I saw the poster. And it, it, um, it, it said this, it said, David Cheriandi abandoned his mother who is suffering from dementia. Please, well, you enjoyed us, odd, so it's so a date to, <laughs> to tear a this a-hole read. <laughs> they, they didn't say a-hole, right? <laughs> but um, uh, what, what surprised me, but then what, uh, what that, um, that poster really did uh, nail in another way is that a connection that people often make between the book and mm. the author. Yeah. So they were assuming I was the character in this book who, who does come back home and, you know, <laughs> and tries to make amends. Um, but I didn't, my mother didn't suffer from dementia. My, I, had a, I, have a, I had a grand aunt who I was very close to who did die of dementia. And um, there were other reasons why I was interested in forgetting, uh, as I'm interested in cultural legacies, I'm also interested in forgetting, which is, they go hand in hand, right? Um, so it's a complicated, I mean, I just mentioned that because it's such a complicated question that I... I uh, so you don't know whether there was any, th th there's no connection you can make between upbringing and, and being a writer, Gurjinder? I think it, uh, for me, it goes back to what Anosh said about, um, you know, being an insider and an outsider. I, I felt very much like a an insider and an outsider in my own life and that, you know, within the Indian community, I was, I was an insider. However, I wasn't, in that context, I wasn't quite Indian enough. Uh, and then in the context of, uh, of you know, social Western um, uh, uh, context, I, I wasn't Western enough. So I, w I was neither thing and the ability to be uh, neither thing allowed me to really look at them objectively and, um, 
uh, and and to to try to to figure out what are you if you're if if within the Indian community you're not Indian enough and the Western community you're not Western enough where are you? It, it gives you a really great um, I think it gives you that the distance that Anosh was talking about without actually having to you know leave the country. So for me that that played into the desire to write. And Anosh, aside from from the distance. I mean, you obviously come from a family of, of storytelling and storytellers. Yeah. It's just embedded in... And, and also in Indian culture. I mean, oral storytelling. I mean, nations like Africa and India have uh, ancient cultures, have oral storytelling. Um, as, as a tradition, it's almost in our blood. And I remember, I mean, uh, the first time I told a story, and I had a pet cockatoo named Polly. And, you know, Paul, I was an only child, so I, I had no friends. And... <laughs> I used to, maybe three or four, four years old, and I used to stand below Polly's cage and tell him stories. And one day, after one such uh, storytelling session, Polly died. <laughs> <laughs> so, I, so I knew that I had a gift. And, <laughs> and I think, uh, also, when I, when I came here, I, I felt that... Um, there were some things about Bombay or some of my experiences or some of the characters that I had come across which almost compelled me uh, to write. And, and there was this lady who was very special to me. Um, she was like a spiritual guide to me. And when I was 18 years old, she had told me that you will one day become a writer. And this is long, long before I had written a single word. I mean, she just knew me and it was her instinct that uh, said that you should write. And she said you won't be known in India in the beginning. She had even said that. And wow. um, she moved to North Vancouver in 98, and I came with her. And, um, you know, she's, uh, she's pa she passed away a few years ago, but uh, in a way she gave me that, that direction of, of believing in myself when I hadn't written a single word. We had a, a writer named Michael Crummy at the festival a number of years ago, and right mm. in the middle of a, a reading, somebody in the front row collapsed, and everything had to be brought to a halt, and the ambulance came, and the guy was okay. But I'm thinking we could for, get a firm together we, of literary hitmen, <laughs> <laughs> and, and we could just send you guys out, you know, on, on contract to, you know, have people fall off their perch. <laughs> I wouldn't mind. You wouldn't mind? Yeah. A noble profession. Um, <laughs> all right, David, have you okay. got your yeah. section? Long ago, she began to forget. It started with ordinary things, shopping lists and recipes, bus change and savings cards, pens for jotting down those household tasks that always managed to slip away. But then, mother began to forget in far more creative ways. She began to forget names and places, goals and meanings. She began to forget the laws of language and the routes to salvation and the proper things to do with one's body. She began to excuse herself from the world we knew. My brother and I were the first to notice. We were young children when it started and naturally alert for the smallest signs of adult weakness. When mother wasn't looking, we'd climb up to the cupboards and eat peanut butter and corn syrup lime pickle and molasses, also the most perverse delicacy we could then imagine, Crisco shortening, spooning up the white sludge with our fingers and leaving greasy prints on the cupboard doors and the walls and the doorknobs. Mother couldn't understand why she never remembered to replenish her cooking goods, while she never remembered to give the home a good all-round scrubbing. We were never caught. Of course, mother was minding five or six other children in those early days. Her wits were already strained to the limit. Friday evenings, the children's parents would come and apologize for the days when they were forced to work overtime at their offices without proper warning. They would smile apologetically when handing mother envelopes. But what messages were these people passing her really? What kind of people enveloped their words? This was still the earliest stage of mother's condition and she had already learned to conceal her confusion from others and trust that, in time, things would become clear. She would wave the children's parents goodbye and open the envelopes carefully with a knife, sorting through the small numbers of fives and tens, dirty numbers, meaning new safety boots for her husband and belts for her boys and, of course, more endlessly dwindling cooking goods. Money was still too precious a meaning to forget. But soon, 
there came to the times when mother hurriedly dressed one boy in his snowmobile suit and ushered him to his parents waiting outside, only then to remember too late that these parents had a girl, that girl with the haunting glass marble eyes and the brilliant golden hair, or brown. She would have had brown hair, mother reminded herself. Mother would laughingly explain to the parents just how difficult it was to tell the difference between boys and girls these days. Just look at the rock star, she would say, nanny stand up. But her jokes fell flat and mother steadily lost her jobs. She was supposed to be minding children after all. She was living on the edge of a bluffs near an active railway. Metal monsters in the night, dirty numbers and greasy doorknobs. This was our belonging. Memory was a carpet stain that nobody would confess to. History was a television set left on all night. The car chases and gunfights sponsored by oil companies. The anthems at the end of broadcast days. Is that it? Thank you. you before you read, you mentioned uh, that poster about you abandoning your mother and not everything is autobiographical. But I, you know, as I read uh, the three books uh, and knowing you, some of you a little better than others, but knowing a bit about you and, and doing research, it's clear that there is personal history and, and autobiography in your books. What rules do you use to say, I can plumb this from, from my life, but there are things that I'm not going to, to go into. There are areas that I won't touch. Yeah. Well, I, I try not to hurt anyone um, in the sense of I try not to make anything personal. And uh, if there's something that is too close to... If you can really recognize something as being, uh, this is exactly what happened, then I try and stay away from it. Uh, and also the, the characters lead you towards a higher truth. I mean, there's a difference between fact and truth. And sometimes you have to abandon the facts to come to a sort of more emotional or spiritual truth. So eventually that is what I focus on, rather than this happened or that person had done this and this is exactly how I want to portray it. Yeah, very similar. I, I always think about what my intention is. So if my intention is to reveal something that is uh, shown through um, a situation that might have been a real situation and my intention isn't to uh, oust anyone or to hurt anyone, um, then I believe that that, that story it can be told. Uh, I think that there are so many things that, that feel familiar and feel real and that's why we read. I mean, so for example, in, in Everything Was Goodbye, I wrote about a family that has six daughters, uh, you know, and the father has passed on, that that is my family history. Um, however, the things that happen to them are, are different. Uh, and I, I ask myself, there, there's probably lots of families that have many daughters or where, um, you know, someone passes away. So just because they may feel sensitive about it, um, am, I, am I okay to allow them to feel sensitive? And I was. And um, sometimes it's just about having conversations with people um, and, and getting them okay with things as well. If you feel that it, it's going to um, come close to them and they may not be as ready as you are. I mean, I couldn't put it any better than those two responses. I think, uh, I think, I think there's an ethics to writing and uh, we, as there is an ethics to being in the world in any sort of way. And uh, uh, at the same time, there is the higher truth of writing or the, um, and uh, there's a responsibility of the writer to that higher truth and to the uh, naked truth telling. That's part of that responsibility. Um, that said, there's also this other, other concern, which is um, regardless of what you write, uh, sometimes you have no power over how you're going to be read. And people may then find themselves in writing that you thought you had made um, impersonal in, in a certain way. And you mean somebody really discovering you had based something on somebody, you thought you'd Absolutely. covered it up? Absolutely. And Absolutely. they found, so then what happened? Then there's a very angry phone call. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> and uh, I remember I did have one f such phone call with, uh, with a family member, and um, I, I remember it mostly not because I got very upset, and, um, and I, I threw out all of this uh, in retrospect, kind of a, a, at once precious nonsense, and, and what was actually true is, uh, I'm sorry, I'm a writer, I, I, I have to... I have to say certain things. I have to. I, I don't. I didn't think that this was going to be taken personally. I didn't think you would read this character in as yourself. I didn't think others would read my book at all. Never mind read you, <laughs> <laughs> you know, as this character. And um, and so, um, so. But I remember. I remember uh, me, you know, being getting getting very upset. And I think it was the contradiction between. You know, I think one's ethics as a writer, and then also the fact that there's a type of responsibility to be truthful and to be free as a writer too. Yeah. And there's a hard balance. Any and, angry phone calls? No, well, lo not phone calls, just confrontations. <laughs> but um, I mean, what David was saying was interesting because sometimes people fail to see themselves in your work, also. Yeah. You know, like, <laughs> that was you. <laughs> in, in this book, um, I remember someone coming up to me and saying, "That character, that guy's a freak." And <laughs> in my mind, I'm saying, "That's you." Yeah. <laughs> but I, sure, I'll take it. You know. I've heard of a lot of people. Uh, I, I mean, thinking that they're in a book, uh, sh absolutely sure that a character is based on them, and it's not. But, you know, whether it's they want to be in fiction or not, I don't yeah, know. Yeah, I actually had that situation. A family member, an extended family member, was sure that a character was based on, uh, on her. And I'd wondered why, they, why, she'd, why she'd stop speaking to me. Um, and then I, I found out, oh, don't, you know, pretend you don't know, pretend you all don't know, uh, that uh, she, she thinks that I, I wrote about her, which, which wasn't actually true. I hadn't even thought of her. There's really no resemblance or likeness, but it's... Um, Did you clear it up? No. <laughs> no, I, you know, we, we weren't that close, so I'm okay with it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and then there are other people that, that, uh, that phone up and think, uh, I think every man I've ever known thinks that, that he was a love interest. So... <laughs> 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 Right. That's a That's good great. lead into your reading. Sure. I'm looking for myself in here. <laughs> there was a man that looked like Michael Andachi. <laughs> <laughs> I don't understand. It's not the first time anybody's ever connected us, and he's devastatingly handsome with these beautiful blue eyes. I don't know whether you've ever seen Antachi's eyes, but they're quite striking. Well, when I hug you, I imagine him. <laughs> <laughs> You're going to be invited to every single yeah, festival no. that has that. <laughs> well, and I'm inviting Michael the next time, too. <laughs> Wonderful. I'm blushing. Uh, let's see. See, I, I've lost my train of thought now, Hal. As I walked home, I wondered if the aunties on the street had seen me leave Liam's house, and if they did, whether they would report back to my mother's. My sisters and I referred to them as the Indian Intelligence Association. As members of the IIA, they were induced by their morals to spend their afternoons looking out windows, gathering gossip, and delicious details that they spread through a, gra a game of broken telephone. They were a blend of town crier and gossip columnist who spun stories like webs, occasionally devouring victims like my sister Harge. Two years before, she'd been walking home from the bus stop when a group of dumb Indian Punjabs in a yellow Trans Am followed her home. They'd been following her every day for a week, and every day she'd come home in tears, too ashamed to repeat the things they had said. She knew not to turn around, not to pay them any attention, but the sound of their car rolling over the gravel made her skin prick with fear, and like animals, they sensed it. It was the only encouragement they needed that day. They pulled their car up beside her, and one of the boys jumped out, grabbing the back of her arm, pulling her against his body, laughing as she begged for him to let her go. The aunties must have seen, sorry, the aunties must have watched from behind their sheer living room draperies. They must have heard her cries. 
They must have seen the trail of dirt and stones as the car careened away. Because when she came home, my mother had already been told that my sister had gotten in a car with a group of boys. Harge tried to explain what had happened, that she had been grabbed, driven to an empty lot. Her words fell back, swallowed in open-mouthed sobs. My mother slapped her. Serena rushed to Harge's side to save her from more injury. My mother dropped her hand, her eyes full of the questions she saved for God. Harge, who had studied sociology in university, once told me that we were a natural target for judgments. A family already wounded was easy prey for a community that often turned on itself. She ran away a few months later. Despite my mother's attempts at reconciliation, she would not return home. Tej and I visited her once, and though we were appalled by the squalor of her east side apartment, the mouse traps in the corner, the red bricked views, the black mildew on thin paned windows, we said nothing of it. Her roommate, who I later realized was her boyfriend, was sitting on a plastic patio chair by the window, chain smoking cigarettes. Harge didn't introduce us. She acted like he wasn't even there and made us jasmine tea from the small green packets she had taken from the Chinese restaurant she worked in. So how is mom, Serena, AJ? She asked after everyone the way we were taught to, and we summed up family health in small, reassuring statements that opened to truthful size. What will you do? Tej asked. Where will you go? I don't know, she said. Perhaps admitting it out loud frightened her, because for the rest of the visit, she stared out the dirt-streaked window without saying a word. When we came home, my mother called us into the kitchen where she was making roti. I couldn't tell if she was angry or if the dry heat off the cast iron tava had simply settled onto her cheeks. Gopi, auntie called. She said she saw you in the city today. She's wrong. I glanced at Tej. I was at school and Tej was... Before I could finish my sentence, my mother lifted her hands from the tava and hit me. Liar. I fell back and reached for the counter to steady myself. My mother turned the stove off and walked to her room, where she stayed barricaded for the next two weeks. She ignored, our knocks, she ignored our knocks, our pleas at the door, our tear-soaked apologies. The only person she would speak to was her brother. Mamaji came by once a day, and each time he emerged from her bedside, I looked into the room to see my mother lying in the near dark, discarded tissues piled on the nightstand next to empty teacups. Once she saw me peeking in and told me in a small voice to come inside. I hesitated, my steps short and heavy, approaching with the trepidation of a child looking upon the old and infirm. I sat on the edge of her bed, saying nothing as I listened to her breath fall into a sedated sleep, slow and rhythmic, perfectly prescribed. As I rose to leave, she startled and clasped my hand, looking at me as if I were a stranger, the edges of her reality softening into the mercies of sleep. I sat in the dark, watching the little light there was play on her face like a language of dreams. I lay next to her and slept there for the next year. Occasionally, Harge sent me a card. Any time one arrived, my mother stared at it for a long time before asking me to read it to her, and then she was disappointed when all it ever said was, Missing you, XOXO Harge. Sometimes my mother would buy a box of Ludus and send it to the return address. I told her that Canada Post would not deliver Ludus to a P.O. box, but she insisted on sending them. They were Harge's favorite. My mother was always saddened when the crumpled box of sweets was returned, stamped, address unknown. She took the contents, the broken bits, sugary yellow crumbs, and scattered them on the lawn. For the crows, she'd say. Thank you. We're going to uh, open things up to you for questions in a few minutes, so I just wanted to prepare you to uh, make notes, mental notes, about something that you might want to ask, because I'm sure you've, this conversation, I hope, has provoked some thoughts of your own. Um, I think it's the father, uh, Mina's father, in uh, your book, Gurjinder, who very early on, within the first 10, 15 pages, I think he says, how we remember this is how we exist. And I know that memory plays a part in, in every one of your books. So I'm interested in, in why, and may, I'm gonna start with David because that's clearly such an important part of your book, but, but why you're interested in memory and how you worked with it in, in the novel. 
Um, you're right. I, I, got, I became very interested in memory, um, personal memory, and uh, f uh, I guess uh, familial memory, and then cultural memory. But in a sh uh, and because I was writing about dementia, uh, you know, literally when someone is is in this state of uh, increasing uh, forgetting, uh, that those questions became more, more and more important. Uh, but strangely, in the book, um, forgetting itself started to become more and more interesting to me. And um, I guess it was as I became closer to a character who is uh, undergoing this unbecoming, um, I, I wanted to see, maybe naively, um, but also with, with intentions I think were, were positive, I wanted to see forgetting as a type of as a type of uh, journey that had its own deep bitterness and sorrow, but also its moments of humor where you could forget that you'd met your son, you ever knew your son, and then have a conversation with this person that you felt this great affinity to, this great warmness um, towards. And, um, and then I became, you know, there's philosophers, Nietzsche talks about, he believes, uh, uh, in order for a culture to, you know, to survive, there there needs to be forgetting <laughs> in a in a strange way. Um, I'm not sure if he's my uh, ultimate authority in <laughs> all things philosophical or or cultural, but uh, I became more and more interested in in that process and um, and and its interaction with memory. In Danu Road. Um the, the thing what I realized was the, the reason I was interested in memory is because uh, within memory lies uh, a secret, you know. Everyone has a secret. And um, the character of the grandfather, um, he, he had a secret that was eating him up. And when uh, the incident that starts off the book, this tribal man who works on a farm, uh, when he ends up killing himself by hanging himself from a tree, um, the grandfather's storytelling, the wheels of memory uh, start turning uh, and um, he has a, a close relationship with his grandson and he wants to give the grandson the history uh, but in trying to conceal the secret that's exactly how he ends up revealing it. Hmm. So the follow-up question should be about everybody's secrets, right? <laughs> no, okay. <laughs> Gertender, memory. Uh, yeah, I'm still very interested in memory. Um, memory and grief and absence, I think those will be uh, themes that I'll, I'll always touch on. What I'm interested in about memory is, is what is remembered. Um, you know, in the case of Mina, um, the only thing that is remembered is the grief uh, and, and how, um, as a young person, she later begins to um, assign love to grief. That, that that's the only way she has seen her her mother experience memories. They've been grieving memories for her father, and yet she knows her mother loves her father. And so as she grows, she begins to interpret this feeling of absence and grief and misinterprets it for love. Um, and so I always wonder, you know, why do we choose to remember what we do? Um, and and as as people without without memories, with, absence has such a big impact. Um, on on a child, and so if you don't share stories, they will they will make them up. They, they will find something um, to fill them with. So, yeah, I think it's it's very defining. Uh, I think that that everybody needs roots and the memory and the storytelling and the presence of the past. It provides that. Even though those stories get transformed and transmuted, and I I, I know I'll tell a story and any number of people will say, that's not the way it happened. But, you know, you, you make it into a better story in a way. Well, that's what fiction is for. That's what fiction yeah. does, right? And some writers do it even in nonfiction. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, you're up. Yep. So I'll just set this up uh, quickly for you. Danu Road, it, there's, a, there's a town called Danu in India uh, where my family used to own Chiku farms. Um, it's just two hours outside of Bombay. And it's a love story between a young Zoroastrian man named Zyros and uh, a woman, a young woman who works on his farm, a tribal worker named Kusum. And one day while Zyros is walking through his farm, he sees uh, a tribal worker who's hung himself from 
uh, a tree and this happens to be Kusum's father. And that's how he comes into contact with Kusum and, and, and the story begins. Uh, the section I'm going to read, um, so Zairos has just seen, uh, he's just had an interaction with Kusum, he's just discovered the body. And now he's uh, on his motorcycle, he's going towards this place called Annas, which is like a hole in the wall, chai stall, uh, which still exists today in Danu. Um, and all the Iranis used to gather there in the morning um, just to have coffee and... As Zairos rode towards the Annapurna chai stall, he welcomed the sun. He hoped its heat would burn away the memories of the morning. He went past the abandoned train bogies, the bales of straw waiting to be transported to Bombay, the liquor booth where tribals numbed their brains for a few rupees, the furniture shop that sold only mustard benches, until he hit the main road, which was a dusty, rocky mess. After he passed Allen's petrol pump with its wilted array of coconut trees, he turned left and almost ran over Pinky, a six-year-old orphan with an eternally runny nose, who had perched herself close to Anna Purnas to secure her daily dose of tiger biscuits. Anna, the owner of the chai stall, was an Indian Clark Gable, thin moustache, clean skin, hair always set in the most well-behaved manner. No one knew his real name, so he was called Anna, or elder brother, the title given to any South Indian man who wore a lungi and ran a chai stall. Anna had an old Hollywood charm, but his wife was quite the opposite, dusky and full enough to be on the cover of Debonair. To the Iranis, Anna's chai stall was one of Dhanu's most prized possessions. It was a beloved meeting place. Its hard wooden benches had seated many an overweight Irani over the years, a dingy hole beautifully suited to the hirsute features of the men that frequented the joint. At Anna's, they were like beasts in a cave, where they could joke, smoke, abuse, and pontificate. Of course, they did this anywhere, but Anna's was the home ground. Each morning, after making a round of their chiku farms, the Iranis would gather here and drink tea, coffee, or Pepsi. Cigarette smoke gave the place a sinister haze, like fog in a cemetery. Yet the place was alive, full of joy and horniness, and credit had to be given to Anna's steaming chai and his steamy wife. <laughs> Anna stood under the sharp white glow of tube lights and poured chai from one steel jug into the other to cool it down. It was quite a show, this hot waterfall of milky tea, and Anna was always guaranteed an audience. There was Mirwan Mota, the fattest man in Danu, who polished off three omelets at a time, his little blue diabetes bag by his side. Beiruz, the smoothest bald head in town, who owned the spare parts shop next door. Keki, the Italian who smoked BDs in a corner and brooded over Kamu, and Dara Atom, the town's official godman come healer, who was only a few chicken breasts away from being just as huge as Mirwan Mota. At its peak, which was from 9 till 11 in the morning, Anna's chai stall offered a heady cocktail of languages. Anna spoke softly in Tullu to his wife and loudly in Hindi to the balloon factory owners. Some of the Iranis conversed in Dori just to remind the ones who did not that they were inferior and had been polluted by India. And the inferior Iranis, who spoke Gujarati, spoke it in a crass manner to make the actual Gujaratis, the Indian ones, feel infuriated that their language was being bastardized in the cheapest way. <laughs> but in the end, if one kept some distance, one could see the beauty of Annas, that brothel of languages. All languages knew each other well, were familiar with the twists and turns of each other's bodies, and were not afraid to inhale the pungent smell of each other's underarms. Zyros heard a sound in the distance, a motorcycle zooming at full speed. Soon, one passed by on the tarmac. It was his dearest first cousin, Bumble. Bumble was his father's brother's son, two years older than Zyros. His real name was Farhad, but he was called Bumble, as in Bumblebee, because he whizzed around on his motorcycle zigzag, zigzag, without any aim at all. He often overshot his destination because he was going too fast to stop but he would never admit this. However, he was an expert rider and his bike was a beauty, a red BMW. This morning, he was dressed in a Santa Claus costume and he did once again miss his destination. He returned his cotton white beard hanging to one side, his Santa cap flopped out of his pants pocket, but his black aviator Ray-Bans balanced perfectly on the ridge of his nose. He parked his motorcycle and walked over to the blue car outside Anna's in which the gamblers of Danu were indulging in their favorite, most sacred activity, rummy. Men whose bodies were 70% cards, not water. Aspi Irani looked over his silver reading glasses each time he threw a card on the black suitcase that served as the card table. 
and his brother, Bumble's father, the left-handed Sora Birani, shuffled cards with fervor and dedication that would put any religious man to shame. This hallowed vehicle was known throughout Danu as the mobile casino. The car was running and the air conditioner was on. There had been complaints about the mobile casino from the residents of the nursing home above Anna's, and in response to the complaints, Aspi Rani had installed a buffalo horn inside the casino. With the precision of Big Ben, he pressed the horn every hour, the loud grunt of a buffalo, a reminder to the residents that the mobile casino would not budge. If anything, it had found a voice. Keki, the Italian, brandished a copy of a new book, Nietzsche's Thus Spake Zarathustra. It has nothing to do with our prophet, he said, but the title got everyone excited, especially Aspirani, who read a few pages, drove off in his car, and returned with a Sony two-in-one. He pressed play, and as Anna fried vadas in a sea of oil, classical music was heard for the first time within those walls. It's by a composer named Strauss, he said. It's called Also Sprach Zarathustra. And boss, even this has nothing to do with our prophet. <laughs> then another song followed, a rock number by Queen, whose lead singer Freddie Mercury, a.k.a. Farooq Balsara, was Zoroastrian. Now this man sings the truth, said Aspi Rani, <laughs> as he joined Freddie in singing Fat Bottom Girls. <laughs> Zyros wished his grandfather would come to Anna's. Every once in a while, Zyros would ask Shapur Irani to sit with him on the benches, even if he remained silent and just listened to the frying of eggs in Anna's kitchen. Shapur Irani always politely declined. Maybe he thought of Anna's as an aberration. But on days like this, when Zyros had found a warly man hanging from a tree, Anna's provided a strange balm, and he could appreciate the lunacy of it all. The humongous Mirwan Mota, highly diabetic, eating strawberry ice cream and dollops. Beiru scratching his bald skull, gripped by a Hindi graphic novel called The Day My Wife Bled to Death. <laughs> Keki the Italian telling him to read a real writer like Tolstoy. And Beiru's, upon hearing that name, giving Keki a disgusted look. Anna's was Zyros' cocoon, and while he sat there, cozy in his extravagance, he thought of Kusum in the back of a tractor, with only an old, fatigued woman to help her cope with the loss of her father. There was no sugary chai in her world, no air-conditioned car where gamblers hug their cards tighter than their wives, and certainly no leather wallet fat with cash to serve as a cushion when she sat down. As she went home, all she had was the burn of daylight and the roar of a tractor to aggravate the strain on an anguished racing heart. So now it's... Over to you guys for questions. Oh, this is excellent, right here. We... Oh, hi, my name is Anu, and uh, uh, I was in India for 25 years, the first 25 years of my life, and I relate more to Anosha's experience than to Gurjender's, just because of the familiarity of experience. Um, I, I do understand about how you guys have uh, tried to find your identity uh, with different backgrounds, memories. My question to all of you is, but then how do you define Canadian identity? Did you guys find it? Well, I'll just be very honest with that question. I, I don't have the time to define Canadian identity <laughs> because, you know, as a writer, you're, you're worried about the rent. You're, you're worried about the next Canada Council grant application. <laughs> um, and you have and, to work. And you have, yeah, I know. But I think for, for me, it, this is something that um, will happen eventually. And, and um, also in, in a country like Canada, we, we, are, we have the ability and, and the freedom to have panels like this and to discuss, you know, identity. Uh, so that's the gift that we have being here. But in India, if you actually had a panel like this, people would think you're insane. Um, so my, my, my answer to that is, it is something that will shape itself. I don't know if I'm the right person to define it, and I don't want to, because my work will continue to shape um, the identity in, in some small way. Uh, so that's my contribution to it. Um, I, I, um, I, likewise, I'm, I, I'm not sh I definitely know I don't have a final answer when it uh, comes to Canadian identity. But I do have a, a, a feeling that, uh, right now that you know, identity of any sort 
is, um, is a fiction that is uh, achieved through forgetting as well as memory. And that applies to Canadian identity. We have forgotten things, and that's how Canadian identity has been achieved, as well as we have remembered things. And I think as writers and as citizens, um, it's paying attention to both of those things when we forget and when we remember and how we can be good citizens somewhere in between while paying the rent and living our lives and, and uh, attending to all of the very important things uh, around that. Just hockey. <laughs> yeah, I think, uh, you know, that, that, that is, I think, the, the quintessential thing that runs all cultures in Canada is, is the love of hockey. Um, but when I think about Canadian identity, I think Canadian identity is otherness. It's otherness uh, coming together and otherness clashing. Um, and so this dialogue is the Canadian identity. Um, I, don't think that, I don't think that it will ever be one thing. It will always be the coming together and the clash of many things. Thank you very much. Uh, I, I want to follow up the question when you get the Statistics Canada form or when you travel and it asks you what is your race, what do you label? Because when I see Statistics Canada forms, the racial categories, white, black, and then seven categories of Asians, and then luckily there's other, so that's what I put global citizen and all of the above. Mm -hmm. But when you go to the immigration and you say uh, that I'm global citizen, they say you look Asian. <laughs> so I'm just wondering that, that I, I like, I don't mind be, being called Asian, but I was born in Africa, my parents were born in India, and I'm living here, and I've never been to India yet. <laughs> so the only thing I know about India is Hollywood, Bollywood, and some of the Indian summer festivals. So, so the main thing I, I, w I would like to ask is, it's, it's always the issue when you are traveling, when the racial, and I think it is a problem in, the, in Canada because I personally think, why don't we use continental names like Africans, Asians, Europeans, there are only six, and anybody who doesn't belong to those six, then you just plug them as global, <laughs> right? But, but the other question is, I, I wanted to ask you is, if, if you are Canadian writers, what do you learn from First Nations writing and the lifestyle, and how do you incorporate in your, in your, in your novels? Thank you. Well, the first part, um, that's something for the bureaucrats to decide, you know, it's, which column you take is really not something that I would spend too much time thinking about. But First Nations, if you look at it, again, oral storytelling. That's something they have in common, that's something India has in common, that's something Africa has in common. And it's when the oral storytelling, um, when that knowledge, when that wisdom is actually transformed into the written word, I think something is gained, and at the same time, something is lost. You know, for instance, in, in Zoroastrianism, I'm a Zoroastrian by religion, uh, a lot of our sacred texts were passed on from the priest to the priest orally. And then when Alexander invaded you know, Persia, uh, the priests were killed. And with that, a lot of our prayers, a lot of our knowledge was lost. And even the, the texts that had been retained, that had been written down, were burned. So I think you know, it's, it's important both to retain that oral storytelling tradition as well as the written word. Uh, so for me, that's, that's the direction where I will be going at, I think, for the rest of my life. Um, in terms of the, the tick box, um, you know, I suppose I, I always just tick South Asian if there is one. However, in Canada, I prefer to, to just call myself Canadian and if need be, you know, have that hyphenated with the Indo-Canadian. I tend not to move through the world um, outside of Canada, Canada announcing myself as South Asian. I, try to stick with Canadian and see how that lands with the person I'm speaking with, see if they need more after that. Um, but the reason I, in Canada I don't identify with South Asian so much is I, I feel like it doesn't, it, it doesn't um, represent the fact that I'm also Canadian, you know, that, I, that I've made my life here, I've lived here, 
my um, my values are just as as influenced by Canada as they are uh, my parents' country of origin. Um, so that's the the tick box. And as far as First Nations, I think again similarity is is family, uh, tradition, uh, community. Um, so that's something that that I'm still very rooted to through my own culture and the value of that and um, um, the respect uh, the respect for traditions. Um, so so I, I bring that into my writing and I see a similarity there as well. Um, I guess that, you know, that first question, um, I guess it, uh, for me it often depends on who's asking and what is the context and what are you, what are you hoping to get and uh, am I comfortable with what you're hoping to get so that and there are contexts in which, uh, you know, I, I might have to insist I am Canadian, you know. <laughs> Uh, and other contexts, I'd be, I'm, I'm happy to remember, remind people that uh, I'm of African descent, I'm of South Asian descent, uh, I'm from Scarborough. Uh, <laughs> you know, uh, I guess it, it, oftentimes it depends on the context. Um, second question about um, First Nation writers and, and experience, I guess um, for me, what, what, um, what, um, I can take away from that is um, stories and experiences that um, uh, in certain contexts for, for others, for people like me, newcomers, even though I was born here, um, have been forgotten. And uh, you know, this, this, this kind of a discussion we've had about the importance of memory and, and how uh, in the act of forgetting or in a secret, uh, there is the, the um, the drive to create narrative. Um, well, there's, I think there's a lot of uh, kind of forgotten and unspoken experiences and stories uh, throughout this land. And, and uh, for me, uh, experiences of First Nations people um, are, are just very prominent when it, when it comes to that, uh, that, that issue. So I have a lot of learning to do, I guess. I mean, I'll just add very briefly, there was one, you know, when I gave my citizenship exam over here a few years ago, um, I always looked forward to it because I wanted, you know, I, I wanted to get settled here and all of that. And when I went for the ceremony and I had to give up my Indian passport, um, for the, it, it hit me for the first time that I will no longer have an Indian passport. And uh, that was quite an emotional mm. thing for me. I, I, didn't, I never thought that would have an effect on me because I hadn't thought about it. Mm. But when I actually had to give up my passport, I experienced a sense of loss. But at the same time, getting a Canadian passport, there was this tremendous sense of pride that um, I now have two homes. Um, so I may have two identities, I don't know. And it will continue to shift. Um, and, and it's important to keep asking those questions, but not try and define it. For me, just keep on asking the question. I think it's really interesting that in, the, in your question is partly the answer to the first question, which is, uh, I think that this is a country where within a couple of generations so many people are going to be part something uh, that answering, uh, you know, trying to identify discrete issues of race is going to be silly. And, um, and I think that another hallmark of, uh, I hope this is true, of, of Canada is that we are quite comfortable with that notion of of mixture of people um, coming together from different backgrounds and different cultures and marrying and having children and those children, you know, we're, we're a polyglot, becoming a polyglot uh, culture and, uh, and I think we're comfortable with that. What happens is the children are called half Canadian, half Japanese, half uh, Asian. So that's my worry that yeah. where does the, it's cutting japa roti into half or something. Sorry, that's what I'm a bit concerned yeah. about. That. Yeah. Other questions? Yes, over here. Oh, or oh, right here. Yeah, just stay there and then we'll uh, go over to Asha. Hi. Um, I just had a question, which is like a complicated question, but uh, I'm from Bombay as well, and I moved here in 2001. And um, I just wonder if with all of you guys, because I have friends who are just grown up here, but they're Indians or from London, moved here. Um, 
but they don't really do the same kind of dialogue I do. But even though I am, because I'm from Bombay, I'm from India, and they're actually from London or moved to Canada. So the, we do connect, but it's different. So I wonder, the question to you guys is, all of you, um, when, why have you not gone, like, do you ever want to go back to India? And like, why, what is the reason you want to be a Canadian? And all of you, and, and you are Canadian from, from childhood, so do you find, if, if you have visited India before, or your native land, like your parents' native land, um, do you feel some kind of connection there? And um, if that is true, um, either way, like if you're here, do you remember going back? Or like you know, this mis mishmash of feelings of where do you really want to be or who, do you, who you are, that's the whole point of this show. And um, do you get those feelings? And, and if you do, what do you, what have you made up your mind at this time in your life? I know it will evolve through your writing, through your aging, but what is current feelings and where you stand? Well, when, I'm in, when I'm in Canada, Thanks. I want to go back to India. And when I'm in India, I want to come back as soon as possible. So that's, <laughs> that's my shifting state uh, continuously. But what I've also realized is that Canada has been extremely open and, and welcoming to me. And I think my future is here. I mean, um, as a storyteller, this place gives me, like I said earlier, the perspective, both in terms of time and physical distance, to write about a country that I love, which is India. So I live in a country that I love, and I write about a country that I love. So I have two homes, and I'm extremely comfortable with that. Um. I actually have not uh, been to India since I was a, an infant. Um, and it's something that I've, I've been wanting to do more and more as I, as I get older. And you know, hopefully in the next two years, I will find myself there. Uh, and I, I, feel like, I feel a connection to all things Indian. And I feel a connection to Indian people. For example, if I'm, if I'm away from um, the Lower Mainland and I see one Indian person, I, I often go and address and talk to them, and like I feel the need to connect uh, and to to belong and to say yes, I I am that also. Um, so I, I know that the pull for the country is very strong. The pull of the language, the rhythms, the colors, the people. Um, I almost think that it's even though I haven't experienced it, it's it's part of my DNA. Um, so although I, I don't have any experience, I know that the pull is there and that I will go and and I will feel at home. Yeah, the, the, I, I, would, I would agree that the presence is there for those who, um, uh, ancestral homes for those who have not been born there. I have a, I have a son who's, um, who's five, and um, my, his, uh, my parents, uh, his grandparents, um, often are with him. And he uh, started, um, so my dad, um, it's a really revealing thing. It just, just happened to me re recently. I'm processing it. So my dad said, uh, well, I've noticed that Sky, my son, uh, has a Trinidadian accent. <laughs> and, and so I said, yeah, that's, that's pretty cool, eh? <laughs> and his response was, mm, yeah, don't worry, son, he'll grow out of that. <laughs> 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 and I thought it was, you know, it was really funny and also kind of indicative because for me, uh, this is not simply someone who, like me who was born in Canada but someone the generation after inheriting something of what you were describing, some legacy, mm -hmm. you know, just the, a voice, uh, ways of speaking, never mind all the other things that, you know, that persist. Cultures are pretty durable things, they persist, right? Um, and so, um, but, um, you know, it, it was really, it was complicated because I, I saw it as a source of, you know, pride and my, parent, my dad saw it as a source of concern uh, maybe that's the generation he, when he came to Canada. That maybe that wasn't easily a source of pride for mm -hmm. him. Uh, maybe for me, it's just different. So I don't know. We have a writer coming to the festival in October, our festival, uh, named M. G. Vasanji, who's won the Giller Prize twice, Governor General's Awards. Just an absolutely marvelous writer, born of Indian parents in Africa, 
now living in Canada, and he had never been to India. And I don't know how many years ago he made his first trip. And the thing that struck him was he couldn't believe how comfortable he was in the country, how immediately he felt like he belonged, even though he'd never been there um, and his growing up had been African and, and then Canadian. So it's a kind of, it is interesting how these things all, all play together. I think we have a question up here. Uh, thanks, and thanks to the panel. It's uh, um, um, evoking some interesting, interesting ideas. Uh, just to jump back a bit, uh, um, just a bit of a rejoinder, I think, to some of these, uh, these notions of a construction of an identity within a national framework. Um, uh, Hal, I think I would contest this idea that Canada uh, as a whole is a, is a welcoming uh, or overarchingly welcoming place. Um, what I would say is there are pockets of that and as writers, as creators, and as, as activists within a community, we have to ensure that the, the current trends that are neoconservative uh, and fascist, both in Canada and other parts of the world, we see it happening in India as well, very fundamentalist, can, um, are accruing power to those, the few and the privileged. And I think we have to, to really be, be contesting that actively, and it's a struggle. And I, th and I see this happening in the writers here. And, People I know, it's it's it's, uh, but it's a very important thing. So just a brief comment on that. But my question is actually around um, nostalgia. Um, you're all talking about memory in different ways, and I'm wondering how this element of, and I see nostalgia not as a necessarily positive thing, um, but as um, a way of reconstructing a history that um, th that makes it somehow palatable uh, and maybe even desirable for the current moment. Um, I wonder what your takes are on the notion of nostalgia and maybe the problematics of that. Does it, does it corner us as creators um, in, a, in a sense to, um, to create a kind of, of pap that is consumed, right? So the consumer wants a certain type of thing. And is there a way out of that? Is there a way not to, to bend to those, those desires of nostalgia? Well, um, for me, most of my work is actually reflective of what's happening in, in India right now. Or most of my work is set in Bombay in, in the current uh, day. Um, for me, even if it's nostalgic in the sense of even if you're reconstructing the past or you're retelling the past, as long as you're making people uncomfortable, you're doing your job. Um, I think the worst kind of writer is the kind of writer who allows people to sleep at night. Um, and that's what, you know, popular books do. I mean, there's a famous saying that if you want the mob to agree with you, all you have to do is agree with the mob. And, and that's what many writers are doing. They, they, they create these stories that everyone likes to read. Um, they don't push boundaries. They don't challenge people. Uh, when I wrote Danu Road, I had a lot of people fall in love with the book, and I had a lot of people who were sort of almost enraged. And, and that's perfect, that's exactly what I want. Even when I write my plays, my Mat the Matka King, which was set in a brothel in, in Bombay, in, in the red light district, I remember in the inter uh, just in the monologue in act two, uh, there was a couple uh, in front of me and the main character started speaking and the husband said, that's it, I'm leaving. And the wife said, sit down. <laughs> and, and it's this push and pull. Uh, you know, that, that I'm constantly looking for. Uh, so it doesn't matter whether my story is told in the past, whether it's nostalgic, whether it's sort of highly political, as long as uh, you're disturbing people in some way, in a, in a good way, with, with a sense of style, as long as you're making them shift, as long as you're changing consciousness in some small way, I think you are shaping uh, the national identity. I just think you do it in a more subversive way than actually talk about it and try and find answers. You sort of uh, welcome them and then you punch them in the stomach. <laughs> Let that be a lesson to you all. Um, I was going to say I don't really have much to add to that. I think that that's very accurate that, that um, you know, although we write about memory, uh, it's not necessarily nostalgic. You know, we may uh, show the beauty of that moment, but there is always the subtext of what it really was. What we're trying to forget is just as important as what we're trying to remember. Um, and I, I uh, appreciate that, um, that um, 
reminder of the importance of vigilance um, and the importance of remembering that which is difficult about um, the, the nations we live in. Um, uh, regarding nostalgia, I think one of the, I mean, I, uh, uh, one of the things I think is important for me is uh, marking the, um, the fact that my or my characters look back to another place is shaped by a particular experience, that there are particular desires attached to that and particular fears attached to that. And so it's not an authoritative sort of um, kind of a portrayal of that other place and other time, but that there is a structure of fantasy and desire and fear that's, that's working uh, through it. And I, I, I felt I, I made uh, a special effort to, to do that in the book, to try to um, expose that. There was a question right there. Hi, uh, this is particularly for Anosh. Um, there's an article uh, in today's British press about the concept of the British expat. And it, those people who are here that know about Britain, who I've lived in Britain, um, know that British people, even if they're born or even second generation born outside of Britain and live there, they consider themselves expats. And there's a million, it turns out there's a million Brits living in Spain for years mm -hmm. and years, 20 years. They're, they're not, they don't consider themselves Spanish, they're expats. And the, really, the thrust of the article was about the fact that no one else can be an expat. Uh, if Indians, you know, are born in, or just move uh, to Britain, say, they, they can't be, and they're only there for a few years, they're not expats. And, and uh, this is a question for you. You've been here for, I'm not sure how many years. Are you a, an Indian expat? Well, see, again, that's a term I did not coin. And that's a term I don't understand. And it's a term I will continue to resist. You see, the minute writers fall into these questions, the minute we start agreeing and we start sort of trying to answer questions that other people have formulated, uh, I think we fall into a trap. I've been here 14 years, and my honest answer is I'm still struggling to find out who I am. I don't know. I, I am Indian. I'm very much Indian. I mean, and not only in the Bollywood way, or only in the melodramatic way. I think, uh, you know, in terms of the, the storytelling, the, the culture, all of it, but I'm also Iranian. Um, you know, my uh, grandfather came from Iran. Um, you know, I'm Zoroastrian um, by religion, and Iran and Afghanistan and Tajikistan, these were considered to be the birthplace of Zoroastrianism. There's a place in Iran called Yazd, where a lot of Zoroastrians are still living, and that's a place where I want to visit. So, uh, my last name is Irani. Uh, my grandfather came from Iran to India through Karachi, so, you know, that was, there was no India, Pakistan at the time. We lived in India, and now I've moved here, so I'm confused. <laughs> the microphone is making its way. Thank you. Um, well, when I saw the title of this talk, um, I also thought of the Alice Munro story, which um, kind of means, who do you think you are to be so ambitious, so outspoken? And my question for you was, how do you see uh, yourselves as writers um, provoking and challenging uh, Canadian society? Or do you, and how? I think Anosh has answered that in terms yeah. of your, your real goal is to push yeah. everybody to look at things differently and to have an argument with the text, as it were, yeah. Hey, I think I, I just want to offer something different. I, I, uh, I'm concerned that um, although we live in a multicultural society, that we're not very educated about our neighbors, um, about our cultures, about our backgrounds, our shared histories. So if I can offer some of that, um, that's, that's my goal as a writer, without necessarily being boxed into that either. Um, I certainly don't want that to be uh, my goal in 10 years. That, that's what I want to do now, is just to offer that otherness and to, to get people to... Um, I mean, multiculturalism is wonderful and it's accepting, but wouldn't it be better to be informed um, and, and offer that? 
Ja. Ja. <laughs> um, hi, my name is Trisha, and I identify myself as Trisha when I'm at work or when I'm at school. But when I'm at home with my family, I identify myself as Trish Paul Kaur. So I was wondering how do you feel that the naming of your characters impacts their identity? Well, names, names are, are really, they contain a, a power of their own. Uh, especially, you know, in, in India, when you look at mythology, um, every name uh, has a reason for being that name. Uh, my name, uh, when you know, I found out the meaning of my name, it has, Anush has two meanings. One is immortal and the other is nectar of the gods. So my parents chose wisely. I think they, <laughs> <laughs> That's a bit of a burden yeah. for a guy who doesn't I, like high expectations. I, this is one name I would never change. It's fine. <laughs> Especially when you go on a date and they ask, so what, what does Anush mean? I'm like, oh, <laughs> immortal. <laughs> <laughs> you don't need to say more after that. But I think, uh, you know, characters, uh, I, I do, um, names come to me. And, and when they come, you just have a sense that that name will lead you to the story. So it's a good question, definitely. For me, at least, names are very, very important. They have a lot of uh, weight. And, and there's a lot of unveiling, a lot of secrets in those, in those names. It's funny, it's, a, it's an interesting question. I, re I remember reading um, uh, an author who said, uh, he's speaking about writing, and he says, a character is, first of all, the sound of his name. Um, now, that doesn't bode well for me, because I have been unable to name the characters in my book. Like, the protagonist in this book doesn't have a name. His brother doesn't have a name. Um, uh, in the novel I'm just finishing right now, uh, it's uh, entitled Brother. It's about these two brothers. <laughs> they don't have names. <laughs> um, so I, it's, it's an interesting, I don't know, it's, to me it's a really interesting thing why, um, I feel it's just a, a very kind of weird, I think it's just a personal quirk that I, I seem unable to name my character, and I could, I could try to invent all these reasons why. It's, well, then, then it's more universal. I mean, it's actually not. I, you know, I, 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 I shun that aspiration in my writing in a certain way. I like the, I like the particular. I like, you know, I think there's un the universal in the particular. But uh, uh, yeah. Um, I mean, it's really interesting what's going on here. I mean, yeah. you're talking about the, the name being of sort of fundamental importance to the identity of the character, and when you get it right, and, and David, who doesn't have names for his no, character. Yeah. So. Well, you know what, you know, in, in response to that question, I think what it does, and I think it's the type of writing I do, um, it's by not naming the character, then it forces the characters, I think, maybe into a potentially more intimate relationship with other characters. So it's mother, brother, son. And these are the, you know, these are the kind of the, and so, um, I've just offered that answer and now I, I, I feel fundamentally unsatisfied with that response. <laughs> <laughs> and, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> well, you're also interested in forgetting. Right? Yeah. 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 No, it's, it's, yeah. 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 Have you talked to a psychologist about this no, not naming? No. <laughs> no, I should. <laughs> uh, for me, it's all about the rhythm. The rhythm of the the name. Um, occasionally, I'll I'll try to be clever and and throw um throw a meaning in there. Um, but but generally, it's just about the sound on the page. Um, the books of all of these authors are here uh, and uh, this evening, and they are available to sign books. So we'll take one more question. Happens to be, oh, is there someone down here? Because there's one way at the back, in the back row. Okay, so we'll do two questions, and then um, we'll, you will all buy books, and they will all sign them. Uh, thanks for this evening. It's been a privilege to be here. Um, and I'm going to feel my way through this question, if I may. It's, it's regarding identity. And there seems to be two aspects to one's identity. There's the identity that we um, engineer through our experiences um, that um, color us and who we are through our memories. And then how we want to be seen and how we are seen in the world and how that evolves. And there's that identity that wants to transcend that, that's with akin to the universality of being human. 
How does that color your experiences in your writing? Or that, that, that juxtaposition? Or... It's, um, I, I, I was, I, I'm interested by the way that you've, um, you've framed it. Um, so there's the kind of the personal identity and then there's the, the kind of universal identity. And, um, I'd have to think more about that, that sort of framing. But how I thought you were going to go, I thought you were going to go, there's the personal identity, and then there's how everyone's trying to name you. And of course, one is kind of creates the other in a certain way, right? Um, that there, pardon? That's not my question. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. I don't know. Uh, I guess I... Yeah, it's funny. I tried to spin your question to my question. <laughs> <laughs> and pretty soon I, you'll forget the question. Yeah, I mean, so, yeah. Where, where, where are we? <laughs> um, I guess one way to answer it, I don't know what the universal identity is. Um, and I'm, uh, uh, yeah, I guess, I guess, yeah. I think, it, I think in the writing, it, it all comes down to the universal identity. You know, if you think about the universal identity just as the human experience, struggle, love, compassion, desire for belonging, um, every, every book can be deduced to that. So whether we think about it consciously or not when we write, it, it's probably not the case. I don't think, I mean, maybe Immortal over there has the uh, big ambition, uh, but uh, the rest of us, <laughs> we just write stories. <laughs> well, I, I really like the idea of transcendence, and I think that is something that uh, somehow I find in, in my stories, all the characters are trying to escape from something, but what they're actually trying to do is they're trying to transcend uh, the present situation that they are in. And uh, for instance, I, I had uh, interviewed this um, woman who worked as a sex worker in, in Bombay's red light district. And what struck me about, and she asked me where I lived, and I lived just you know, a few minutes away from the red light district, and I told her where I lived. And she, she asked me, where is that? And I said, well, that's just five minutes away from here. And she just laughed at me. She said, do you think I ever leave this place? And um, that really sort of hit me out of nowhere because then what is her identity? I mean, if our identity is our job, you know, what column we tick. Uh, if our identity is, uh, this is what I do for a living, these are my parents, this is my address, this is my income, this is my home, um, she had nothing. Um, it was almost as if uh, she had no past and she was just not even trying to be there in the room because at that moment it's so painful. So it is about transcendence. Um, and, and when we talk about something universal, I think in, in, all, in, in David's book, for instance, it's um, the memory itself is, the loss of memory rather is, is allowing you to transcend the, the current state that you are in. I, I, that's how I would see the loss of memory. So it, definitely it's a, it's a very valid, valid thing. And I think in fiction, that's what most characters end up doing. Last question. Thank you very much. Um, I hope I don't end the evening on a sour note, and I trust that you'll be able to spin it. Um, <laughs> my father's parents are from Goa. Goa was colonized by the Portuguese. He was born in Rangoon, Burma. My mother was born in Austria. They met in London. I was born in Germany. We came to Canada when I was six. And people often ask me, what are you? Not who do you think you are, what are you? And I say, I'm Canadian. There was a time, though, in the 70s growing up in Toronto, I was ashamed to be Indian because we were called Pakis. And people thought we were smelly and oily. And I wonder if you've had an experience like that and how you compare it to who you are now. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, I, um, yeah, I mean, um, what? I mean, I guess that's, uh, you know, one of the reasons why I, I turned to writing. Um, so people had an impression of me, a story about me, and about people like me, and the way I reacted was to tell a different story. And so, so yeah, I think, I mean, uh, I'm, uh, I'm, 
I'm failing badly to spin it positively, <laughs> and I'm you know I'm touched by by what you what you what you just said because I recognize that you know I recognize that very deeply, um, but um, um, but yeah I guess there's there's the possibility of of the different story uh, that uh, one can tell and one can learn. But I you know just to. To add to that is we've, I'm, I'm sure we've all had uncomfortable experiences or we've been subject to um, stereotyping or whatever it is, but I think we have to celebrate whatever culture we come from. Uh, the minute you start distancing yourself from your culture, from your people, that is the first sign of sickness. And for me, I've never had that problem. Um, you know, I've always celebrated where I've come from. I love India. I think it's an incredible country despite uh, some some very difficult problems, some very uncomfortable situations. And uh, it's made me who I am. Those struggles, uh, that sort of strife, that sort of pressure coming from uh, a culture where there's, and a reality where so much is going on, it's made me uh, strong enough to celebrate and feel confident about who I am, which is maybe why I don't ask that question so much. Maybe subconsciously I know who I am. Uh, or maybe I'm simply trying to transcend who I am right now and, and get to a point where I'm, I'm even better. I have that, the, um, your experience was my entire uh, childhood, adolescence, and uh, um, you know, the, the Paki and, and the, the uh, my favorite was Hindu, and I never understood why somebody <laughs> would make that a slur, that's a religion. And, you know, it's like calling someone you Christian. Like, it's very strange. So, uh, you know, definitely um, that's part of the reason I write is, is to give that culture a voice. But, you know, I, I did what Anosh said you shouldn't do as, as a child. I certainly tried to distance myself from, from being Indian. Uh, and my parents adapted as much as they could um, to being Canadian. Uh, and, but the reason I did that is because... I wasn't rooted in my culture. Uh, my parents and, and that generation of, of adults were so busy working. They didn't have time to share the stories and to celebrate the culture and to give the reasons for the traditions. They didn't have time to transfer that pride. And as I got older and I, I started to feel proud of those things, I could take ownership back of my culture. Um, so I think that's, I think that's a big lesson is, is for for people who are, you know, facing that kind of discrimination, give your children a reason to be proud, uh, and they won't, um, they won't be embarrassed. They will correct that person and say, actually, I'm, I'm not a Paki. I'm from this part of the, uh, you know, country, you know, and they'll use it as a moment to educate as opposed to escape. There's the positive note. Since this is the last event, I'll leave it to uh, Sirish or Philip to close the evening. Well, it's my great, uh, my great pleasure to be able to close uh, this very final event of, of Indian Summer Festival. My name is Philip Steenkamp. I'm the Vice President of Simon Fraser University. And uh, I just couldn't imagine a better way to end. I mean, what an incredibly rich discussion. Really want to thank Hell Wake and our fabulous panel here. Uh, just s such a rich and amazing discussion. And what an incredible Canadian identity we have. So thank you so much to, to, to this panel. Thank you. Thank you. And just, uh, just a last word about Indian Summer Festival. I, I want to thank all of you, um, this audience and all the audiences over the last 10 days who've come out uh, to support Indian Summer Festival. This is the second annual Indian Summer Festival, the second of many, many summer festivals, we hope. Um, it can be no coincidence that the sun came out on day one of the Indian <laughs> Summer Festival and the rain came on the closing day. So we are guaranteed 10 days of summer each year in Vancouver as long as we have an Indian Summer Festival. <laughs> We've also been tremendously proud at Simon Fraser University to be a presenting sponsor this year and to have hosted the events here at the Gold Corp Center for the Arts in the many facilities here and also at SFU Surrey. And I just do want to thank the SFU team uh, who has helped uh, the, the festival organizers put this together. Uh, Michael Boucher, uh, Am Johel, the SFU Woodwoods team, 
We've got folks from the World Literature Program at Surrey here, the, the many, many volunteers. Um, thank you all. Um, but mostly, I really want to thank the Indian Summer Festival organizers who've been just such tremendous partners and who've put together this incredible thing. Suresh and, and, and Laura and, and that team. Thank you so much. Thank you.